while the fictional Blackadder died in World War I, there was a Blackadder who fought with distinction in World War II. The life of Wing Commander Francis Blackadder is a story from history that's worth telling. William Francis Blackadder, known as Francis, was born in January 1913 in Edinburgh. He attended a boarding school with a strong rugby tradition and went on to study history and modern languages at Cambridge. Once graduated, he got a job at the Runciman Shipping Company in Newcastle in 1936. Having shown no previous interest in flying, it's unclear why Francis Blackadder joined the Auxiliary Air Force that same year, but it's thought that he was influenced by an old Etonian and fellow Cambridge graduate, Leslie Runciman. He'd been CO of 607 Squadron since 1930 and set about recruiting other well-educated individuals to be officers. Blackadder's first flight was in an Avro biplane on the 19th of January 1936. He trained mostly at weekends and qualified as a pilot in June that year. He continued training, getting experience in aircraft such as the Hawker Hart and the Demon. By November, he qualified as a combat pilot. On the 28th of March, he was forced to land at Falston in bad weather and tipped his plane up on its nose. On the 14th of May, 607 Squadron suffered their first casualty. Pilot Tim Richardson crashed into the beach at Dorden. It wouldn't be the last casualty 607 would suffer. Blackadder was singled out for duties at the coronation of King George VI. At the end of November, he was moved to Glasgow by the shipping company. This meant he had less time to fly, but more time to play rugby. Blackadder was part of the first Scottish rugby team to beat England on the 19th of March 1938. His flying suffered further because he missed a month's training after this match due to a dislocated shoulder. While Blackadder recovered from his shoulder injury, tensions began to mount across Europe. The squadron's training began to ramp up. From July 1938 onwards, 607 practiced formation flying, recon flights, battle climbs, instrument flying and drogue shooting. After the Munich Agreement on the 30th of September, all of 607's aircraft were painted green. December that year they received their Gloucester Gladiators and would continue their fighter training. The first few months of 1939 saw their training ramp up yet again with combat climbs up to 30,000 feet, aerobatics and RDF tests. On the 3rd of September, Britain declared war against Germany. Blackadder was sent on his first war patrol, but all was quite quiet. On the 17th of October, 607 engaged their first enemy aircraft, a Dornier 17, who was forced to ditch. On the 10th of November, they began to move to France. However, there was very little hangar space for them, and the aircraft were stored outside. Exposed to the elements, the gladiators needed extra maintenance, and often refused to start if it was too cold. In December, Blackadder suffered a near miss with a friendly aircraft that meant he lost his rear wheel, but he still managed to land safely. The war hadn't ended by Christmas, as everyone thought it would, and 607 found itself playing football on Wisson Beach. On New Year's Eve, the squadron had a riotous party that lasted until 5am and resulted in Blackadder dislocating his thumb. As the new year dawned, the weather got worse. Temperatures dropped as low as minus 27 degrees centigrade, and blizzard conditions led to snow drifts five feet high. Engines refused to start, fluids froze, Blackadder even notes that his own hair oil froze. On the 19th of January, only two of the ten aircraft in the squadron could be got going. Aircraft refused to take off in the snowy conditions and had to be towed across the airfield by horses because nothing with wheels could manage. With the weather restricting both the enemy and their own flying capabilities, the pilots whiled away the evenings in posh French restaurants and hotels. Many of the pilots seemed to drink too much in the evenings, and there was even talk of them visiting brothels, although Blackadder himself seems to have avoided them. By February, the ice and snow had melted, but this caused flooding, so flying conditions still weren't ideal. Towards the end of February, a quarter of the squadron was allowed to go and watch the British Army rugby team play France in Paris. Blackadder appears not to have participated due to being severely hungover from a party the night before. On the 13th of March, they travelled to Arras to see George Formby perform for the troops. All this merrymaking, playing football, watching rugby, it's easy to see why this period is known as the Phony War. That would soon change. As the war progressed, 607 found themselves coming into contact with more advanced enemy aircraft like the ME-109. Other units were being issued with Hurricanes, and 607 became bitter at being overlooked. Four Hurricanes did eventually arrive, but Blackadder wrote in his diary, Were we allowed to fly them? Not on your life. 
Having witnessed 109s in action, he wrote that he hated flying in the bloody little biplanes. Finally, the squadron's full complement of Hurricanes arrived on the 14th of April, and Blackadder's first flight was four days later. At the beginning of May, Blackadder was on leave back in England. In the early hours of the 10th of May, the phony war, as it was known, suddenly became very real. German troops thundered through Holland, Belgium and Luxembourg. Suddenly, the Allies were on the back foot, as the Nazi Blitzkrieg stormed across the country. Blackadder's diary entries from this point become much more of a scrawl than previous entries. He was on the first boat back to France, and his first combat flight, flight was the next day. On his first flight on the 11th of May, he shot down an HE-111 and a DO-215. After this early excitement, he was low on fuel, was leaking oil, and had no ammunition left. He spotted a group of single-engine fighters and decided to fall in with them back to Allied lines. On getting closer, he noticed that they were covered in rude black crosses. Blackadder, in his lone hurricane, was now facing a squadron of ME-109s. Vastly outnumbered and empty of both fuel and ammunition, he dived towards the ground and was forced to land near Hanau in Belgium. It was still in Allied hands, but the Germans weren't far away. After refuelling, he took off again, flying low over the Meuse River to avoid enemy aircraft. Several other pilots were shot down, but only two wounded badly enough to be repatriated. The following day, the 12th of May, Blackadder shot down what he thought was an HE-112. On the 13th, he attacked Henschel dive bombers, who were attacking Allied troops on the ground. He damaged three of them, but was chased away by 109s. Again, he dived to ground level, this time evading the enemy by flying between telephone wires. His aircraft was full of holes and his compasses were smashed, but he was alive. On the 14th, Blackadder found his gun sight wasn't working, so resorted to spraying a group of HE-111s to compensate and hope to hit something. That day, 607 lost three pilots, including an old friend of Blackadder's called Monty Thompson. That night, they flew from Vitry to Douai, and Blackadder's undercarriage collapsed on landing, leaving his aircraft on its nose. On the 17th, he was escorting Blenheim bombers and felt vulnerable to enemy fighters and flat guns, but he did shoot down a DO-17 later that day. With the front line changing rapidly, pilots often spent a lot of time, both on the radio and in person on the ground, convincing airfields, troops and civilians who they were. Matters were not helped when, a, on the 17th, a hurricane with British markings began attacking Blackadder Squadron, and he also reported that the Germans had a Lysander with British markings as well. On the 18th of May, his diary entry begins with the words Der Tag, or The Day. Before the 6th of June 1944, the expression D-Day meant Day Day, as in the day that an operation was beginning, the big day. Blackadder was scrambled against enemy aircraft in the morning and was just heading for home when disaster struck. At 600 feet, his engine seized up and was forced to land without an undercarriage. He hit his head on landing, but nothing too serious. He worked out that he was over 100 miles from his base at Vitry. Knowing that Jerry was using Allied planes to ambush and confuse pilots, he removed the compass and the machine guns from his hurricane before destroying it. He then borrowed a car and drove himself the 100 miles back to base. The situation on the ground at this time was, was chaos. Huge traffic jams of people trying to escape the Blitzkrieg clogged up the roads. Many downed pilots had to hitchhike back to their bases. Later that day, Blackadder was put in charge of four squadrons of fighters and four squadrons of bombers on a raid east of Katu. They were immediately ambushed on takeoff by 109s and lost five aircraft. In his diary, Blackadder describes it as a slaughter, and for the first time he writes that he was actually frightened. He continued his mission, but when he returned to base, he had an emotional breakdown. Of that evening, he wrote, Five minutes later, the heavens were rent with gunfire and a tremendous battle was staged between our Hurricanes and the ME-110s. Mars was indeed angry. Blackadder had been in constant action for over a week, often flying multiple sorties a day. He'd been shot down or forced to land at least twice, he'd lost friends, people he'd known forever, uh, he was suffering with lack of sleep. The German advance was so quick that pilots often weren't landing at the airfields they took off from. All of this put enormous pressure on the pilots during the Battle of France, and it still wasn't enough. On the evening of the 18th of May, Germany launched a major attack against the Allied airbase of Vitry. Fighters shot down Allied aircraft in the air, while bombers dropped incendiary bombs on the hangars and workshops burning the aircraft on the ground. This led to the unit moving from Vitry to Neuron-Fontaine. 
the Allies were being pushed back towards the sea. On the 19th, the squadron commander was killed, having only been in charge for two days. That day, Blackadder flew a recce patrol and passed over a German mechanised column only 100 feet below him. Nothing the Allies could do could stop the advance. That afternoon, 607 Squadron was ordered to leave France as best they could. The German Blitzkrieg had done its job and the Allies could no longer hold back the onslaught. After over a week in constant combat and at least one emotional breakdown, Blackadder was considered war-weary, but at least he was alive. Some members of the squadron flew themselves back to Britain, but Blackadder was a passenger. By the 20th of May, he was back in Blighty and on leave until the 29th. 607 Squadron's official count is recorded as 73 aircraft shot down, and some estimates put it at twice that. It's a possible record for the Battle of France, but the cost was huge. Of the original 18 pilots in Blackadder's flight, seven were missing, four were in hospital, and another five were posted to other units, with one of these pilots being killed in the fighting over Dunkirk. Blackadder only records two pilots as being safe and sound, including himself. On the 4th of June, 607 Squadron were told that many of them were to be decorated for their efforts in the Battle of France. Blackadder was awarded the Distinguished Service Order. His citation reads, This officer has shot down three enemy aircraft and led his patrols with judgement and excellent offensive spirit. In particular, he carried out single, several extremely important reconnaissances of bridges and roads at a time when other means of obtaining news were not effective. His reports were very valuable to the army. After this, Blackadder began a week of accompanying Lord Trenchard around various aerodromes on morale-boosting visits, but his war wasn't over yet. After the Dunkirk evacuation, British backs were to the wall. With most of the army's weapons still left on the beaches of France, and the navy reluctant to send the fleet into the channel, it was down to the air force to hold back the impending German invasion. Blackadder might have been back home, but he was still on the front line. Churchill famously said, the Battle of France is over, the Battle of Britain is just beginning. Having returned to his home aerodrome of Usworth, Blackadder took part in various training flights and a few scrambles to deal with enemy aircraft, but to little avail. Eventually the squadron was ordered south, and on the 8th of September they arrived at Tangmere. Pilot Harry Welford of Blackadder squadron said, We arrived at a completely blitzed aerodrome and were greeted by the remains of 4-3 squadron, some were on crutches, others with their arms in slings, and yet another with his head swathed in bandages. In mid-August, the tiny little village and aerodrome of Tangmere had been attacked by over 100 Stuka dive bombers, and many of the buildings were left in ruins. One of the pilots defending the aerodrome was Billy Fisk. Born in Chicago, Fisk had pretended to be a Canadian in order to volunteer for the RAF, and became just one of around seven Americans to fly in the Battle of Britain. On the 16th of August, Fisk was in the thick of the fighting when his fuel tank was struck and his hurricane caught fire. Despite his arms and legs being on fire, he refused to abandon his aircraft. He landed on the airfield and was taken to Chichester Hospital a few miles away. He died the following day from his injuries. Fisk became one of the first American pilots killed in World War II, a full 17 months before America joined the war. The action began immediately for 607 Squadron. On the 9th of September they were scrambled and were still climbing when they were ambushed by 109s. Within seconds two pilots were missing, two wounded and several aircraft damaged beyond repair. In one engagement the squadron had lost half its aircraft. Over the next few days 607 squadron saw, saw off various attacks by JU-88s and all was relatively quiet after that, even on the legendary 15th of September, now known as Battle of Britain Day. 607 Squadron weren't given clear instructions from their controllers and didn't see much of the enemy. Two days later, the squadron had two pilots shot down, one of them killed. The survivor of the two was Harry Welford, the pilot who'd commented on the damage to Tangmere when they arrived nine days earlier. He was taken off flying duties due to injury and spent most of the rest of the war training pilots. On the 26th of September, Blackadder shot down an HE-111 and an ME-1010 over T Southampton. The following day he flew five different patrol flights, and on the day after that he flew a search pattern over Selsey looking for two of his squadron who'd gone missing. Pilots Will Gore and Milne Irving were two of the few pilots left who'd served with Blackadder and 607 in the Battle of France. We can only imagine what he was feeling while searching for them. Blackadder flew in several patrols over the next few weeks. 
with varying successes along the way. On the 30th of September, he shot down two aircraft and damaged several others. On the 10th of October, 607 Squadron left Tangmere for Catterick. After an operational patrol on the 13th of October, Blackadder only flew training missions for most of the rest of the year. At the end of October, he was made controller of operations at RAF Turnhouse and began to fly less frequently. Having survived the Battle of France and the Battle of Britain, Blackadder probably felt that his luck had to run out sometime. He married Elizabeth Cale, the second cousin of fellow 607 pilot Harry Welford. He was mentioned in dispatches on New Year's Day, and all, all his flights after this in 1941 were touring around various aerodromes as part of his work as a controller. On the 1st of June, he was posted to Northern Ireland to take command of 245 Squadron. Throughout the war, most of his flying had been done in Hurricanes. On arriving in Northern Ireland, he was given a Spitfire and decided to see what she could do. While doing some aerobatics, the hood of the cockpit collapsed. Fortunately, he was uninjured. On the 8th of September 1941, he was back in Hurricanes and flying offensive patrols over France. On the 13th of November, the squadron was visited by the Duke of Kent. In July of 1942, Blackadder left 245 Squadron to be a controller at Rudlow Manor. After this, he attended Army Staff College as a Wing Commander Tactics before finding himself at HQ Allied Expeditionary Forces in September of 1943. On the 1st of January 1945, Francis Blackadder was appointed OBE for his services to the RAF. Over the next few months, Blackadder flew a range of aircraft including Mustangs, Tempests, Austers, a Moth Miner, a Mosquito, a Tiger Cat, a Thunderbolt, and on the 2nd of April 1945, he took his first flight in a jet aircraft, the Gloucester Meteor. Also, rather strangely, he got to fly in an ME-109 and later a 110. On the 8th of May, he recorded in his diary in bold writing that hostilities ceased in Europe at 0001 hours. Blackadder finally left the Royal Air Force in November of 1945 and returned to his previous job at the Runciman Shipping Company. He didn't stay out of the cockpit long though, because in September the following year he rejoined 607 with a few old hands and continued his time as a part-time pilot. Blackadder finally retired from active service on the 27th of November 1950 after 14 years both part and full-time flying, mostly due to an increase in workload at the shipping company. He retired working life as the vice chairman of the Anchor Lion in 1978. William Francis Blackadder died in 1997, aged 84. The Blackadder story doesn't stop there, however. In 2001, Elizabeth Blackadder was made Her Majesty's Painter and Limner of Scotland, and made a dame in 2003 for services to art. She became the first woman to be inducted into both the Royal Academy of Arts in London and the Royal Scottish Academy. In 2013, Alex Salmond described her as Scotland's greatest living female artist. So there you have it. The Blackadders really did exist throughout British history. From the Archbishop of Glasgow to the Marian Civil War. From the War of Spanish Succession to the Jacobite Rebellion. From the trenches of the First World War to the art galleries of the 21st century. Their story should be as famous as their fictional comedy namesake. But for me personally, the most important one is the story and exploits of a Blackadder who went from a humble shipping businessman to a Battle of Britain hero. The life of William Francis Blackadder is a story from history that was worth telling. <laughs>